This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is a professor at the Harvard Business School and Harvard Law School, Mihir Desai, born in India, raised in Hong Kong and New Jersey. Mihir does a fantastic job in breaking apart a subject, finance, where most people just go, please take it away. I don't want to see it. I don't want to know. I can't understand it. His book, The Wisdom of Finance, Discovering Humanity in the World of Risk and Return, is something that you should read. Probability, randomness, chance, risk, reward. Oh, you might say, this is only for the Goldman Sachs types of the world. Far from it. It's for everybody. And if you don't make it for you in this modern world, I'm not so sure how you will get by. Impossible to get by. But what Mahir does is he goes ahead and takes this difficult subject and makes it palatable for everyone. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mahir Desai. Let me get you to talk broadly about finance. Here you are, you're teaching finance at Harvard, you're teaching law at Harvard. When you walk across the campus, even though people might not know who you are, students might not know who you are, but if you were to take a broad cross-section of the university, what percentage of Harvard students do you think would really just maybe even sneer at the idea of finance? Well, I think it's actually a fairly large swath. I think finance's reputation has really taken a large hit. And sometimes, you know, often, in fact, for good reason. So there is a section of the population which looks at everything in finance with derision, in part because of the financial crisis and in part because of a lot of misunderstanding around that. You know, so for me, that created two goals, which is one, I wanted to demystify finance because a lot of the people who sneer at it actually don't understand it. And if they understood it, I think they'd at least come to appreciate how important it is. And then the other fraction of the population is actually people who go into finance, undergraduates or MBAs. And I've asked them recently in large group settings about how people react when they go into finance. Basically, these people are pretty sheepish and kind of feel bad about having chosen finance. And that's, you know, in many ways, terrible. (laughs) And so I wanted those people to, A, look at finance in a more aspirational way. And then B, reconnect to the underlying ideas, because I think that's how finance is going to get better. So I think the population at Harvard is kind of segmented. There are those who kind of look at it with derision, and there are those who are actually going into it who are, because they're surrounded by people who look at it with derision, who are kind of sheepish about it. Before we dive into some of the meat, some of the direction that you've gone in, this word finance, it's a tough word. And I, I think just you raising the word alone to study it, to think about it, how people perceive it is a really important step. I would think for most people, though, if they know something about finance, they might say, okay, this includes Warren Buffett. This includes passive indexing. This includes hedge funds, subprime, Goldman Sachs, the Great Recession, mortgages. I mean, everything under the sun is possibly under this term. And that in of itself makes it very confusing because... In my mind, if you take someone like Warren Buffett, who was just a man starting out solo, getting a partner, Charlie Munger, starting to, you know, take capital, buy and sell, make money, get clients, uh, you know, shareholders, that's very different than perhaps, let's say, the fall of 2008, where certain investment banks were going to take down the world. So this becomes a a complicated thing to break apart and discuss when there are so many things. You you can add KKR, leveraged buyouts, Mike Milken, so many things under the sun. It makes it very difficult, doesn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, but, you know, that range of 
people and activities gets to the core, right? Which is finance is both, you know, as I kind of cite this 17th century Dutch follower of financial market, it's both fantastic and it's horrible. It's got nobility and it's got terrible behavior. It's got everything in it. The way I chose to approach that, you know, diversity is actually to kind of go back to the core ideas, you know, which is, yes, there are all these people who are doing different things, but at its bottom, you know, what is finance? Instead of trying to think about all these different people, I went to the ideas of finance and tried to organize the book around that because you can understand Warren Buffett, you can understand KKR, you can understand all these people in the context of those ideas. Every chapter, in a way, is an idea. So we start with the basics of risk and insurance. And we go and where we can talk about things like Warren Buffett, who funds his business, at least initially, with insurance and reinsurance policies. Then you kind of go to leverage, so you can talk about private equity. We do corporate governance, so we can talk about either uh, private equity or the global financial crisis. So I think what unifies all those things is the core ideas, which are, you know, as the book tries to argue, actually really fantastic. So instead of thinking about the headlines, let's get past the headlines and let's think hard about what the really core ideas and activities are that all of finance is preoccupied. And then you find that it's like pretty fantastic stuff and it's like pretty interesting stuff once you get past those headlines. Let me take you right to the, the most basic, perhaps, which is the idea of a buyer and a seller, a creditor and a debtor. And at the root of that, which I think is the most, perhaps the most amazing part of finance, is the idea that we can have prices that generally, especially on markets, that we can believe in. It's a pretty fantastic idea that one could go out today right now and either buy a, a share of Apple, and if you happen to own a share of Apple, you could sell it. And you could find the price where people agree right now that the price should be in that moment in time. That's a pretty fantastic concept. And even for the people that might think of finance in a derisive way, well, but every, every day of their life is built on prices. Right, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's amazing for two reasons. One is because we can actually observe prices and transact at those prices. But as you, you, know, you know well, the more deeper reason is because that lets you make decisions, right? And all of decision-making is informed by the observation of prices. And without observing prices, how do you allocate resources? How do you allocate your budget? How do you allocate your time? How do you do the most you know, critical things in life? You know, and sometimes I think in finance, we've sold ourselves short, you know, when we say, oh, we create these markets and they're good and so on and so forth. You know, it's, it gets to the core of allocation. And, and part of the book is saying, not only does it tell you about the core of markets, but I have this, I think what is, I think about this, like a fantastic quote from Nietzsche in the introduction, which is, you know, he also says, just like you did, which is the condition of being a buyer and seller or the condition of being a lender or creditor is actually, or lender or borrower is actually core to the human existence. Like, you know, he kind of says, like, as long as we've been around, people have been interacting and transacting in this way. And the idea of obligation, for example, when you borrow, it's like core to who you are as a human being. So it's not just that we see these incredible things in markets. You know, his point, and I think the point in the book is, all these ideas are like deeply rooted in the human condition. So when you borrow, you create a linkage with someone else. And that, according to him at least, is like as old as anything else in the world in terms of defining who we are as people. You know, it's kind of amazing in a system-wide sense, but it's also kind of amazing at the individual level as well. You know, trust is really so key there because if you, if anybody out there listening can imagine what came before prices, what came before a buyer and a seller, a, a lack of trust. And if you have a lack of trust and one person wants something that somebody else has, then you're left with violence. I mean, prices... Prices are just so critical. Absolutely. And, and you know, that in a way is another way of talking about how fantastic finance is. You think about what occurs and it's without it, right? Which I think you're right is either um, violence or authoritarian, you know, re resource allocation, which, you know, I don't think any of us really want to go back to. The problem for people in finance is you can't then just say, hey, finance is great. We're awesome. So, you know, don't don't pick on us because then that leads to lack of reflection and then you don't kind of confront some of the underlying problems. So I think part of what the book is trying to do is stand in between these people who, you know, these extreme points of view, which is either finance is the devil's work 
or, you know, finance is like this incredible thing, which all of the world should be praising. Unsurprisingly, the truth lies in between. <laughs> you know, there are things that are going on in finance that are fantastic, and there are things that are going on in finance that are really problematic. And so that middle ground is, you know, as unattractive as middle grounds are today, apparently, <laughs> you know, it's really, really important because otherwise we get to really bad outcomes, either the demonization of finance or, you know, finance running wild in a way that isn't necessarily productive. Well, you bring up that demonization of, of finance, Wall Street versus Main Street. And at the beginning, I kind of laid out, okay, there's a difference between, let's say, a Warren Buffett and a Lehman Brothers. And I think that's what, and this is kind of a big picture issue. I'm not sure you went there as much, but I was just curious your perspective. For the audience out there, it's it's very difficult when you can know that there are parts of finance that are on the edge and perhaps don't don't deserve to exist. For example, the investment banks in the fall of 2008, two of them went under, two of them were bailed out. And I think for the average person in middle America, they might be thinking, hey, why were those two bailed out? What, what was What's that all about? And I think it becomes very difficult to get some people to even get to the point where I think you make a great case in bringing the humanities in to explain finance. But if you can't really explain, not, not you in particular, but if somebody can't really explain uh, the existence of a Morgan Stanley or a Goldman Sachs today in 2017 without the bailouts, that causes some people in middle America that, that don't have any of that wealth to just go and scratch their head. It's, it's a difficult one to accept. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think you're raising this interesting question, which I hadn't necessarily entirely thought of, which is, you know, the scars from the global financial crisis are really going to be long lasting. Right. And, you know, I think today we're living with the political repercussions of that and we're going to live with it for a generation because they're going to be people who, who fundamentally, this is the way they think about finance. You know, the question in a way is what to do about it and how to change that point of view. Cause we don't want to wait a lifetime to see that, you know, see those scars heal. And you're, you're not, you're not here to defend bad behavior. That's not the point. The point you're more in the big, you're more in the big picture. And I get that. It's just an, it's, it's one of those things where I think it makes it difficult for some people to even get into your work. Yeah. Absolutely. But I think that's the goal, right? Which is if we just kind of retreat to these stereotypical positions, it's really problematic. And so what the humanities can do for people on the outside, and I'm sure you know people like this, you know, Michael, who are intimidated by finance. They've never understood finance. And because of what has happened recently, they're like, it's terrible. <laughs> you know, basically that's the way it goes, right? They, they don't know much about it. And then something terrible happens. And so they have a very negative impression. Um, but you know, those people, you can reach some of them by telling stories. You can reach some of them by like talking about the producers, as opposed to talking about some complicated CDO, you know, you can talk about them by talking about the Maltese Falcon, as opposed to talking about, uh, Morgan Stanley, you know, hopefully that will get us to a better place faster than perhaps just, you know, waiting for this generational turnover. Yeah, and let me let me bring it to the big picture. We get past some of the current stuff because the big picture goes back to the dawn of humanity. And I think at the dawn of humanity, people learned really quick that chance dominates. I mean, the chance in our life dominates. But even though there's that chance, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We as people do start to have our individual patterns. And this starts to be kind of the foundation for where Finance can be a useful tool to understand. We have this unpredictable. We have the random. Randomness is everywhere. Risk is everywhere. Chance, we, we can't control it. But we have our patterns and we have our ability to think. Right. And I think this is what is was so interesting to me in writing the book. I did a lot of research on this, you know, which is absolutely chances everywhere. But up until, you know, the 17th and 18th century, people understood it with the help of God. Like, so they were just, you know, random stuff was happening, but it was the goddess Fortuna or somebody who was determining outcomes. It was only with the revolution in probability and statistics that we came to understand the patterns. And you know, one of the fascinating things that I found out in writing that chapter is there was kind of an overcorrection. You know, instead of thinking it was determined by gods, people started to think, that it was determined by natural laws and everything was like the normal distribution and everything, you know, was just, you know, actually determined by these laws. And it, it took, you know, it takes this, you know, thing we, you and I take for granted, which is thinking both, yes, it's totally random. And yes, there are patterns, you know, holding those two thoughts in your head at the same time is a really hard thing to do. And in fact, this guy I talk about, which is Charles Peirce, you know, he invented the randomized control experiment. He invented semiotics. 
he used to run around uh, the country uh, saying we are insurance companies. And he's the founder of pragmatism. So he's a philosopher. He understood that the experience of insurance companies is the experience of individuals. You know, what he meant by that is, you know, you're an insurance company. How do you figure out the world? There's a lot of randomness, but you write a lot of policies. You experience a lot of stuff. You get to observe the patterns. And that was hit for him pragmatism. You know, just as you're pointing out, we're all faced with total chaos around this. But if you figure out the patterns, you can actually live through that and survive and do really, really well. And that patterns and that risk is, as you said, the core of finance. So it's not like, you know, some arcane field, the divorce from everyone's life. If you, if you understand it as just being about randomness and patterns and how we figure out the world, then it becomes a really kind of deep, you know, deep inquiry and a really interesting inquiry. You know, maybe it's a great place for you to jump off there. You mentioned insurance and we're thinking about risk and we're thinking the idea about we, you know, it's, it's not just us alone. It's pretty tough to go through life as us alone, but the pooling of risk, this was a really critical, uh, you know, kind of light bulb moment that the early folks had, which is we can pool risk. We can, we can come together and try and take care of ourselves over the course of a lifetime. Again, at the very outset of our conversation, some people might be having this feeling of like, oh my gosh, finance is evil. Hold on. The notion of pooling risk so we can all have a better life is not evil. Oh no, absolutely. It's not evil. And it's incredible in fact, right? And it goes back to some of the most foundational things in human history from, you know, Roman burial societies to shipping, um, to a lot of insurance. It started, with, it started with shipping, didn't it? It started with shipping. And, you know, I, I kind of do a little bit of this in the book, which is the insurance that used to happen was actually a little bit of ex post insurance. And it's called the law of, you know, general average, which is to say when a ship starts to sink, they have to get rid of cargo. And the idea was, well, um, the captain should be able to get rid of whatever cargo he wants. And then ex post, the people who survived, their cargo survived, had to reimburse the person who lost the cargo. So in a way, it's... Because it was it, fair to do it that way. Because it was fair to do it that way. And in effect, we were all in it together. And when the ship is going down, you want the captain to get rid of the best kind of cargo he should get rid of, whatever it happens to be. And so that is like the pooling. And by the way, so many things start with shipping, right? It's, you know, insurance starts with shipping. A lot of uh, yeah, contracts start with shipping. Um, but it makes you think about it in a different way, which is, you know, what pooling is, is us coming together to solve a general problem. And that is, you know, pretty fantastic um, when you come to think of it. And the stories I try to tell to explain this insurance stuff, you know, they, they range from French public finance in the 18th century to you know, California gold rush stories, you know, to all the way up to Tontines, it, it's everywhere. And it's everywhere because we need each other to pool. You know, if we don't, if you pool a bunch of uh, homogenous people, you get nowhere, right? Because if you pool a bunch of homogenous risks, you, nothing gets solved. It's that underlying heterogeneity, which allows diversity and pooling to work. And, you know, that I think has a really nice message, you know, more generally about the way you think about life, about the value of uh, differences and about the value of, of pooling in general. You know, I think back to the beginning uh, for myself back in college, and I think to statistics classes, they were dry. I didn't get much out of them. I, I don't remember any examples that were useful. It was just, it was created more as a kind of a proof or uh, just pure math. And it wasn't attached to the world in a way that I could understand. And it would have really been nice in a statistics class if somebody would have handed me a work like you've put together because people, young people especially, sure, some of the, some of the kids that have that natural math aptitude are just going to get it and it's just a puzzle for them. But a lot of kids want to know, why is this important? Why am I doing this? What's, what's the point? And so much of teaching some of the subjects under finance are taught more as theory, whereas so many people, maybe those kids that walk by you and, and, and would sneer at the idea of finance, they would probably really like it if they were given, you know, <laughs> given it inside some applesauce, so to speak. Yeah, <laughs> applesauce, exactly. Um, I think, you know, I think that's absolutely right, which is, and this is, I think, our own fault in the academy, frankly, you know, which is finance has become more abstract, more quantified, more divorced from human concerns, but at the same time, more precise and more elegant. But, you know, the consequence of that separation from people's concerns 
is that we're isolated and that people are then not going to understand us uh, because it, you know, it takes a lot to try to understand these topics. It's hard. So what I see in my classrooms is, as you put it, you know, people who really want to learn it, but you need to convince them that there's something there that's deeply valuable. And, you know, too often we presume, of course, you need to understand this, you know, and that's not true. You need to motivate things. And, you know, for me, the great lesson of writing this book, you know, as an economist was I had to go back to like telling stories, you know, which as an economist, you become deeply suspicious of because, you know, everything's got to be proved in the data. You couldn't, you just continue to use shorthand. Exactly. And you can't just say like, look at this, uh, you know, look at this regression and tell, you know, look at what it proves. You know, the power of stories is people get caught up in them and then you understand them and then they stay with you, you know? So to do this insurance thing and this risk thing, I do this Flipcraft parable from the Maltese Falcon because it's a great story, right? I mean, there are great storytellers like Dashiell Hammett who really thought hard about these things. And it's a lot more convincing of a way or sorry, memorable of a way, you know, to talk about this stuff, you know, than you know, simply uh, talking about probability and statistics in the abstract. Very topical today. His team just won the NBA championship, Stephen Curry. And you make the point that Stephen Curry, and this is to kind of bring people into the idea of diversification. Diversification, I mean, I, but my audience loves the idea of this, much of them. But a lot of people, they hear diversification, tune out. But if you look at someone like Stephen Curry, you make the point, you say, hey, he did, did not just play basketball alone as a young guy. He did all these different sports. And what did all the different sports give him? What advantages did that give him? And you make the case for diversification with Stephen Curry. Now, on the flip side, when you make that case, I'm thinking to myself as a Washington Nationals fan, and I, I watch Bryce Harper, and I pretty much know that Bryce Harper has done nothing since the age of 10 except play baseball and will probably sign a contract for a half billion dollars. So it, it raises an interesting uh, thought uh, issue there, which is, okay, we have Stephen Curry on one side, we have Bryce Harper on the other side, we're talking about diversification. So it's not that there's not, there's not necessarily one right answer, but at least you're, you're bringing people into the world to think about the topic. Absolutely. And I think, you know, diversification at this very elite level, like Bryce Harper, you're right, it can go either way. But you know, the evidence for athletes at the more, you know, non, you know, <laughs> stellar level is that, you know, diversification for athletes is actually quite good. So if you know you're going to be Bryce Harper, great, specialize. But if you don't, and most of us don't, to be clear, <laughs> um, or our children don't know they're going to be Bryce Harper, you know, in terms of muscle training, in terms of finding out what you want to do, in terms of all kind, of, you know, health and wellness over the course of an athletic career, diversification is massively beneficial. Um, so I take your point, which is it isn't so simple uh, as to suggest everybody should diversify. But if you're not Bryce Harper, um, diversification has a lot of power in it. And, you know, that's one of the examples. I, I My favorite from that is the Stringer Bell story from The Wire, who, you know, he's a guy who really understands. He's a, he's a drug dealer in The Wire, this police show. He actually loves economics and business. He, you know, he tries to really learn about these things. And he ends up using diversification all over the place. You know, in his effort to circumvent the police, you know, he diversifies these burner phones. He makes sure that, you know, everything gets done in a way that you split up and you atomize the underlying exposure because that way is you get the benefits of, of diversification. Even when he talks about getting a game beyond the game, it's like talking about diversification. He wants to go into the printer business because <laughs> he wants to get out of the drug business. He wants to go into real estate because he wants to kind of diversify his risks. So I think that's a lot easier way to talk about this problem, you know, than the way I would normally do it, you know, which is by talking about, you know, the imperfectly correlated assets and the value of diversification in some kind of a cap M setting, then you can start to do that. But if you get them in with this idea of, wow, you know, we all face this problem and, you know, we should think about diversification as being a way to solve that. And that goes back to shipping, <laughs> you know, it goes back to uh, agricultural systems and it goes all the way up to Steph Curry. It's everywhere, um, not just in the, in, you know, in the, in the efficiency stories of finance. I'm paraphrasing, and I think you're pulling from a piece of literature. You can clarify the, the exact piece, but I love the line that I jotted down. Uh, and this was a, a young lady speaking about um, suitors and marriage. Uh, Ten men love me, but I can't marry them all. 
which gets you thinking about diversification yeah. as well. And, it, you and she, you know, she basically says, this is Violet Effingham and Anthony Trollope's Phineas Finn. You know, I try to make the case in that chapter that risk management, of which diversification is one of the major tools, you know, the way that you should think about that maybe is the problem that was facing these young women in the marriage market in the 19th century. And that's Jane Austen and Anthony Trollope. The really interesting thing is they figured out the power of diversification and options back then. You know, you know, she basically says is only I could marry all 10, then I wouldn't have a problem. Right. <laughs> you know, which is exactly right. She has to make a really risky choice. And these suitors, some of them are good. Some of them are bad. She doesn't know which one is good. And she basically says this, you know, she wishes she could diversify. Um, and then she also, by the way, makes the case for an option strategy. <laughs> you know, so both of those are ways of saying these two big ideas in risk management, options and diversification, they're not like 20th century developments that came out of Black, Scholes, Merton and, you know, portfolio theory. They're pretty deep to the human condition. Um, and people have, you should understand them that way. One of the things that you go into, which I really like, and you, you used the word earlier in our conversation, precision. And so much of modern day finance is all about precision. But the reality is human frailty, that's the core. So we can try and have all of this precision. And for example, you just mentioned the two guys behind Black Shoals. And you know, for those that recall, there was another great book out there about long-term capital management. And there was a, an effort there, and th this is kind of past our conversation, but there was an effort there to view the markets and their trading strategy with a certain precision. Let's just pick up nickels in front of the steamroller, so to speak. But life is more Daniel Kahneman, in my humble opinion. It's more prospect theory. It's more, there's edges of those uh, bell curves. And it becomes a little more, uh, a little more interesting than, than just, uh, see, just pretending that life is so precise as much of modern finance would, would like us to think. Uh, absolutely. And that messiness is, you know, really, really important. You know, I think what's interesting to me is the hubris that came along with, um, making finance precise. You know, it's it's related to other things we've seen, which is you just think that, oh, everything's going to follow a typical distribution, right? It's all going to look exactly like we think it's going to look. And of course, it doesn't. You know, one of the interesting things to me in writing this book is to think about how behavioral and irrational things have become a focus in finance. You know, in a way, I'm quite excited about that because I'm sympathetic to some of the underlying ideas. But, you know, I have to say I'm also concerned about it because, Part of what happens when people start talking about behavioral, quote unquote, behavioral phenomenon is they kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, they say, oh, look, weird stuff happens. So that must mean, you know, for example, markets aren't uh, efficient or markets don't follow the rules of finance. You know, one of the strange things that's happened, and this is not the topic of the book, but with the rise of these behavioral ideas, it's almost as if people think a lot of finance is wrong. And, you know, the truth is, a lot, most of finance has been shown to be just fine and right. But, you know, we overdid it. We overthought some of these rationality assumptions. So for me, one of the interesting tensions right now is to both appreciate what most of finance has been about and understand how robust it is, but then to also appreciate these other things that are happening that we just have not, you know, paid enough attention to. Well, I guess when the, uh, when the Nobel Prize Committee gave a prize to Fama and Schiller in the same year, they were acknowledging how difficult this is. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Fama, Gilles, and Hans. And it was just, it was an effort to, I think, do that. I mean, of course, they were both just, you know, tremendously deserving. But you're right. I think we, you know, both of those people have their place. And that type of thinking, both of them have a great deal to add. You know, in a way, what we're seeing today with the rise of indexing, but also with the rise of all these behavioral efforts to kind of think about mastering markets, it is exactly like those two folks who are kind of coming to coming to be seen as really dominant figures in financial markets. You have so many great stories in here, and I have to let you tell a few of them just to wet people's whistles, so to speak. I love, I love where you go with Fred Smith of FedEx. Why don't you lay the foundation there and the story that you tell in the book? Because it really, it illustrates so many issues inside the world of finance and how he handled a very precarious early moment in the history of FedEx, when most people would probably just not even imagine uh, that this huge global conglomerate today, they would not 
allow themselves the time to think back to a moment where it might not have happened. Yeah, it's actually, it's one of the great, I think, stories that I discovered in this process. You know, because some of it's fun to tell via, you know, Greek tragedies, but then there are also these great stories in commerce, like Fred Smith, or like Apple, or like the American Airlines bankruptcy. You know, the Fred Smith story is um, one that I try to tell in the context of options, you know. So, what do people love about options? It's like this asymmetric payoff, right? You know, heads I win, tails I don't lose. And, you know, people kind of forget that one of the ideas in options is that it's an incredible kind of insurance. Because you're protected from the downside and you can access the upside, that's fundamentally, you know, what options are. I tell this in the story of, uh, in the context of, well, one of the great things about options is that it can actually give rise to more risk taking. Um, because that's what options give you a logic to do, right? So because heads I win, tails I don't lose, that's a recipe for risk taking. So the story I tell is the one of Fred Smith. It's early in the days of FedEx and things are not going well, to say the least. It's Friday afternoon. It's uh, this, by the way, is the kind of story which people just don't believe to be true, but it's in his biography. So it's in his autobiography. So you can find it there. It's Friday afternoon. He's got about a $25,000 bill due to his suppliers on Monday. And he's got about $10,000 in the bank. So he's faced with like a life or death moment uh, in the history of FedEx. It's Friday afternoon. He doesn't know what to do. He's only got $10,000. He's got this big bill due on Monday that he's been putting off. Does he really think that, does he really think the firm is probably over if he doesn't pay the bill? Oh yeah. It's like a total life or death moment. It's, um, it's, yeah, as you would imagine, it's just kind of, it's come in the context of a bunch of you know, he's really at this point down on his knees because a lot of bad things have happened to him. He behaves in the way that we would expect somebody to behave who has an option, which is he jacks up the volatility, right? Because we know options, um, it's one of those great instruments. When volatility goes up, it becomes more valuable, just like insurance becomes more valuable when volatility goes up. So he jacks up his volatility and he jacks up his volatility over the weekend um, by taking that $10,000 and going to Vegas. And he turns it into $40,000 and FedEx goes on to live another day. And it's a great story because, uh, A, it talk, it kind of shows you how volatility actually increases the value of options and how options can give rise to risk taking. But it's also, you know, the story of kind of near bankruptcy situations and why near bankruptcy situations are so interesting because equity holders actually don't really own the firm. They own a call option. Because they own a call option, they have every reason to jack up volatility. And that's why, you know, these distress situations are so interesting, right? Because the equity holders still retain control, but they don't really own a linear payoff structure. They own an option. And so what should they do? Jack up volatility, just like Fred Smith did. And it raises all kinds of interesting questions. You know, um, A, it's just a great story about Fred Smith and FedEx to think like this guy who now you think of as being, you know, incredibly successful and everything was easy for, you know, he had to really struggle, but it also raises issues like ethical issues, you know, like on Friday when he goes to Las Vegas, is he, you know, whose money is he playing with? You know, is he playing with his money or is he playing with the money that actually the borrowers, I'm sorry, that the lenders should have already had? Um, and that's why bankruptcies, you know, as you know, are so interesting because there are all these ethical issues. Like, is it right to go gamble all that money or did you just steal from all your lenders? Yeah. So it's a great story that I think captures the nature of options as a risk management device. Um, but then also how it can induce, you know, risk taking at that moment in time though, where he's at the near death moment, it's different to go to Vegas. Whereas if your company would not be at the near death moment, because you have, you're already dead. You're on your back. If you don't take that risk and you could actually, someone could turn around and make the argument the other way that Fred Smith was brilliantly putting the odds on his side to help the most people by doing what he did because he knew he was already dead. Absolutely. And he was totally rational, just to be clear. I mean, he had every incentive to do what he did. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, if you were the lender, right, and you said, you know, if you were the lender, you'd be like, geez, this guy that $10,000 is really mine because on Monday I'm taking over the business because you have just failed. If you go and gamble that $10,000 and it turns into zero, I just lost my $10,000 and you get all the benefits of it and I get all the losses. So it has this kind of, in a way, kind of very mixed, in a way it's like this fantastic story about an entrepreneur, but it's also like, wait a second, is what he did right or not? Or how do you think about that? So it has both those aspects to it, which I think is really fun. 
I want to go into a few more stories, but I want to lay out a larger issue that you put in your work, which is so many of these problems that we face as adults, financial problems, and a lot of the topics that we're talking, a lot of topics that we won't get a chance to cover in the book, so many of our perceptions, how we understand, it's not just necessarily how we were learning or not learning in school. A lot of this is rooted in childhood. And I assume when you make that point, a lot of our understanding perceptions of finance rooted in childhood, this really means it's rooted in observing perhaps family, parents, friends when we were young, because when we're young, we don't know anything. We're just a, you know, bundle of mush. We're just taking in what's around us. Speak to that because it's a really interesting point. It's arguably a, a happy and sad point. Happy in the sense that, okay, let's say you had a, a rough childhood, then there are ways to get you to a better understanding. But it's also sad in a way that perhaps some people never get out of that hole and never get to a good financial understanding because their influences were so rough as children. Yeah, no, I think it's, I mean, I think this is what happens to you as you grow up, right? And you have kids of your own. I have three daughters. And, you know, the first thing you just come to realize is how formative, you know, childhoods are. Um, and, you know, it's one of those crazy things about parenting because, you know, they're incredibly robust, but you also know that it's incredibly formative. And so, you know, I think that operates on two levels. You know, on one level, it's just so important to talk about financial literacy and to get people to understand finance. I'm just so struck by how little we think about financial literacy and incorporating it into K through 12 or even college. Um, because I see so many people who just don't understand the basics of finance, but then it goes to like even deeper levels, right? Which is, you know, I often think about this, you know, with my daughters about risk taking, you know, how do you inculcate a sense of risk taking? How do you get them to observe when things are good risks or bad risks? That is so core to how people grow up you know, but we don't, and it's core to finance, right? I mean, it is at its base, like the idea of what are the risks that are worth taking and how do you assess that? Um, so I think a lot of what happens in childhood, A, is important just because it's life skills. You might call it life skills, like financial life skills. But then there's this deeper question, you know, which is how do you think about protecting yourself? How do you buy insurance? What does pooling mean inside a family, right? I mean, because in a way, the law, the most, the oldest insurance mechanism in the world has been the family, right? What do we do in a family? We pool our risks and families have been doing that for millennia. So it, it is really core to the way you think but about, some, but some families don't do that at all. And they don't have, they don't have any of that understanding to begin with. There's this none. Uh, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And it's tragic. And you know, there, there, what you can hope for is you know, either maybe better financial literacy but, you know, it is really, really hard to overcome. And this is, you know, not my field, but I mean, if you think about some of the stuff that happens as children, it's really hard to overcome after that age. If you don't understand how families can be risk sharing mechanisms, that's a hard thing to kind of create after you're 20 years old. Right. Um, unless you observe it, unless you live it. Um, and I, of course, benefited enormously from parents who, you know, who created that safety net. Right. Who let you take risks and who, you know, you knew that part of what you were doing in a family or an extended family, for that matter. And this goes back to, you know, the upbringing of my father and mother in India. The extended family was a big risk sharing mechanism. You know, that's what it was. And so that, you know, goes pretty deep into people's psyche, I think, uh, you know, as they get older and older. You know, to kind of give a, a positive little fun story that I just witnessed and I'm kind of inspired by reading your book and kind of going through your work. I was told the other day that my nephew had found a place that he could buy these fidget spinners. He's in seventh grade, was buying these fidget spinners because he knew that he could turn around and sell them at school and make money. And I just, I thought to myself, gosh, I don't really even care what the kids' grades are, but I like that. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I like that. <laughs> well, it's about kind of, um, A, filling a need. It's about um, entrepreneurial spirit, kind of figuring out how to make things happen. And it can really be, you know, formative for people over the long run. One of the great, and it, by the way, it can have its negative consequences too, right? So I, I tell the story from one of the Theodore Dreiser novels about finance. A kid who buys a box of soap and then he basically borrows a lot of money from his father to go do it again and again and again. And he learns like the magic of leverage, right? <laughs> Which is he finds a need and then he borrows, a, buys a bunch of soap, borrows a bunch of money and then just makes a killing which is spectacular. 
But the lesson he learned was, you know, for the rest of his life, he's taking these outsized risks um, that are fueled by leverage. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And they destroy some people and they save some people. (laughs) But it is exactly as you said, these childhood experiences that become, you know, very, very formative over the longer run. You're kind of hinting at also that insatiable desire that you write about as well, that you get you get a taste of that leverage and then it's like, ah, I can keep doing this. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the you know complicated parts about writing the book is I, you know, I basically say there are all these ideas in finance that are fantastic and noble. Then I have to kind of come to the current reputation of finance. How do you reconcile the nobility of these ideas with the current reputation? And I, I try to advance this idea, which I think is really actually kind of interesting. Um, excuse the language, but it's called, you know, the asshole theory of finance, which is, you know, why do some people in finance become jerks, really? And I think the logic is the following, which is nowhere in no other field do you get such instantaneous, high frequency feedback that's very quantified and that occurs at the scale that happens with leverage as you do in finance. So you have investors who, from very young ages, observe outcomes very, very quickly that are magnified by leverage, and they have to make sense of them. The point I try to make is, what do we know about how people make sense of the world? And the answer is, you know, they make attribution errors, which is every good outcome is their responsibility, and every bad outcome is the responsibility of the world. But in finance, those outcomes are so large, and they happen at such a high frequency that the mistakes, those attribution errors that people make are larger and larger than ever before. And so what I observe in people in finance, the ones who are fantastic are humble and they talk about their mistakes and they talk about their losses. And the ones who aren't, you know, they never talk about a mistake. I know a lot of successful people in finance who I've never heard them talk about a mistake. And that's got to take a toll psychologically because in their mind, they're basically saying everything good that happens to me is my responsibility. Everything because you know, they've made mistakes, right? Everything bad that happens has got to be the responsibility of someone else. So I think that to me speaks to like why it is that some people, not all people, but some people in finance who are quite successful end up behaving in a way that's, you know, not quite as humble as they should be because the lesson of finance is luck is like a dominant force in your outcome. And that's lost on a lot of people in finance. Let me take you to a big topic area, which I think is really, really relevant core to today's world. It sounds a little dry at first, but you've got a great story to break it apart, which is agency theory. And why don't you start with, there's actually two elements here that I want to talk about with your producer's example. Uh, This would be a Mel Brooks show. And, And I think the big picture there is that, you know, if you give somebody money to invest, and you can extrapolate that to every kind of complicated concern that you can imagine, but why do you get the money back? You know, why doesn't everything just collapse into a series of frauds? Why does it even work at all? Why is that trust even there? That's a huge, huge, huge a uh, foundational element that where people that might say to themselves, ah, I don't want to hear about this finance, Great Recession 2008, hold, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Agency theory is something that we all have to have some feeling about. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I mean, arguably, I think this is the biggest issue and problem in modern capitalism, you know, which is this idea that, you know, 150 years ago, most of us had the privilege of working for ourselves. You know, not all of us, but most of us did. And so then the person who owned an asset was the person who controlled it. Meaning, you know, you had a little store or you were trading something or you were a farmer. You were both the owner and the manager. And the defining hallmark of modern capitalism is owners are not managers. Um, so I don't get to run Apple. I just get to own some shares. And so that creates this agency problem, which is I got to, I'm a principal. I'm the shareholder and I got to have an agent, you know, in this case, Tim Cook. So the way I try to tell this story is, is of course the producers, which is this like spectacular movie from 1968 and then a musical, uh, starring Zero Mostel and Gene Wilder as Bialy Stock and Bloom. And they come up with this great scam, which is they're going to raise Instead of 100% of the money they need, they're going to raise 25,000% of the money they need. So way more money than they need. And then they're going to produce like the worst show ever. The investors will not come looking for their money because it'll all be a flop. And then they'll run away to Rio, basically. (laughs) And of course, they produce, you know, springtime for Hitler. They try to make it as bad as possible. And it turns into a massive hit. 
and the investors come calling and they go to jail. The reason I love that story, it is because as you said, you know, we appoint people as our agents all the time. It's kind of amazing that anything gets returned to us. <laughs> um, and then that begs the question, how does it happen that capitalism works, which is how do we have a system where we give money to people we don't know and we expect them to take care of it? You kind of think about all the mechanisms that we use today to figure out that problem. You know, sometimes we'll why is everyone not Bernie Madoff? Exactly. And so and there will be Bernie Madoffs. And part of the problem is even just the presence of a few Bernie Madoffs makes this problem really hard. And so it's not like everybody's evil. It's just that some of them are. And you can't really find out who. And that's the problem of asymmetric information. And that's the problem of the principal agent problem. And so what I try to do is kind of tell the story of how, you know, a lot of what you observe in capital markets and in finance today is just the principal agent problem playing out, right? So in the Apple case, right, um, you know, in a way, what's happening there, I tell the story of the shareholder revolt when Apple had to disgorge a lot of cash. You know, it was basically people saying to Tim Cook, people like David Einhorn, Carl Icahn, saying, look, we're the principals, you're our agents, you're sitting on our cash, you give it back to us. But so that's the principal agent problem there. When you think about it, though, you know, David Einhorn and Carl Icahn themselves are agents of other principals, you know, which is some pension fund. And that pension fund manager is really the agent of some underlying principle, which is the pensioner, you know, which is you and me, let's say. So all of kind of capitalism is this daisy chain of principal agent problems. And once you see it that way, you know, you see it everywhere. And then what I try to do in that chapter is say, well, you know, look, this idea of a principal agent problem you know, which is, hey, I'm a principal, I need you to do something for me, how do I get you to do that for me, is actually a really powerful frame on your life generally. And Mel Brooks turns out to be a guide for all those things, you know, which is obviously in work settings, you're often going to find yourself to be a principal or an agent. But even in family settings, often you're a principal or you think you're being a principal or you think you're being an agent, but the frame of being a principal agent um, actually really is helpful in thinking about a lot of personal situations. And that is kind of what that chapter is about, which is not just, hey, you know, think intuitively about this deep problem in finance, but then, you know, think about how your life actually manifests that same basic problem, you know, all the time when you're trying to do something for your child, but you actually end up pursuing your own agenda <laughs> or, you know, when in fact you're trying to serve some expectations of society rather than actually being a principal yourself. You know, it's one of those weird ideas where you can kind of confine it to finance. Oh, yes, there's an agency problem. But it's actually got manifestations in all different parts of our life. One of the things that I love about that chapter and where you go with Mel Brooks, there's another, at the kind of the end of the chapter, there's a part where Anne Bancroft, an actress, is, is speaking. And why don't you speak to that story? Because I love... I love what Brooks came back and said about the piece of paper. Boy, that's so true. Explain that one to the audience. So part of what I try to just talk about is this principal agent problem and how it, you know, is more general. So Anne Bancroft is this spectacular actress. She's married to Mel Brooks for, you know, more than 30 years. She probably deserves a, a prize for just surviving that. But she's a great actress. And Mel Brooks, of course, is a writer and producer. One day, Anne Bancroft has, you know, been working all day at some new movie she's doing. And she comes home and she's complaining. She's like, oh, I was so hard today. You know, the director was terrible and the script is terrible. And you know, I don't know, blah, 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 blah. She's complaining, complaining. Mel Brooks just stands up and holds up a blank piece of paper and says, you think you had a hard day. This is hard, you know, pointing to a blank piece of paper. And I think that's, you know, really instructive in many ways. So in the narrow setting of that story, he's saying, you know what? Being an actor and actress is fine. It's hard. But you know what is really hard is actually writing the words that actually actors and actresses say. And that's a little bit of a principal agent story. You know, it's hard, you know, hard being an agent of the writer. But let me tell you, being a writer is really hard because you have to actually come up with your own story. And of course, that applies more generally in life, you know, which is it's really hard to come up with your own story. And that's what most people struggle with their whole life, you know, which is trying to come up with a story that they're telling themselves as opposed to fulfilling some story told by their parents or by their past or by society's expectations, you know, confronting the blank sheet of paper is like the hardest thing in the world. It's just another way of saying, you know, being your own principal as opposed to being an agent for someone else is actually like the hardest thing in the world. You know, you put that great line in your book, which I'm not so sure most of 
traditional, quote, white America would get. I do because I've spent the last five years in Asia. But tiger moms beget future tiger moms. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, that, yeah. and that is, you must, and I'm sure at Harvard, you see this all day long. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, these tiger moms are basically this, you know, fan, a really interesting book that Amy Chua wrote several years ago. You know, Asian parents have this stereotype of, you know, basically really running their kids pretty tough. Is it a and, stereotype? <laughs> you know, know. It's, yeah, it's been true in my life. Um, um, it's, but, but, you know, know, it's not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it is what it is. And it, it, a lot of these kids are super successful. Well, they're super successful. And of course, the tiger mom phenomenon is, you know, they get trained really well because their mothers are never, you know, satisfied. And so they just keep jumping higher and higher. And, you know, that's great in the sense of they get good at tests and they get good at pleasing people. But, you know, of course, the story is also that, you know, basically they're just being agents. Like they're not thinking about their own agenda. They just get really good at being an agent. And, you know, many of them wake up at like 40 years old and they're like, what the hell am I doing? Like, I'm just jumping higher and higher for God knows what reason. What am I, what do I really want? And so, you know, the good outcome is they try to figure that out. The bad outcome is basically the next generation is does the exact same thing uh you know and the, and then the and then the tiger moms have children who are just like that and that that pass, gets passed on generationally i find this is kind of a little off topic but it's in the same headspace i find the nice synthesis of the tiger mom and mel brooks with a sheet of paper in singapore I find this nice, this nice kind of connective tissue, not necessarily perfect, but one of those few places in the world where I feel like that, that tiger drive is there, but then also that kind of creative, here's my blank piece of paper, I'm going to figure it out spirit. Not necessarily for everyone, but it's one of those places where I find it, that nice uh, combination. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point. In fact, because they, and in part, the reason I think you find it there is because they had to, right? I mean, yeah. the story of Singapore is one of necessity where a very small island nation, trading nation, heterogeneous population, they had to figure out a way um, to survive. And of course, you know, the success of Lee Kuan Yew was, was just figure out a really, a plan all his own that was suitable for Singapore. He didn't adopt a model. He had to figure it out himself. And that is in many ways, you know, the story of Singapore. So I think, yeah, I think it's a great example. You've got some awesome examples in here, awesome stories. I highly recommend people digging in. It's it's not what you would expect from a book that has a finance in the title. The, the, the title, The Wisdom of Finance, Discovering Humanity in the World of Risk and Return. This is not what people are going to expect, but it's it reminds me also, there was a book years back, uh, Peter Bernstein, I think The Remarkable sure. Story of Risk. Yep. It, you, it, it seems a little ins, a little inspirationally in that direction, kind of breaking things down more to the story level. Absolutely. I think, yeah, Against the Gods, as well as Capital Ideas, were Bernstein's books, which are spectacular books. He tells them through the stories of literally the people involved in finance. I kind of go, in some ways, one level of abstraction higher, which is the stories are not the stories of Paul Samuelson and Bob Merton. It's the stories of Mel Brooks and, you know, Jane Austen. Uh, so it's even a, it's a, like a slightly different level of abstraction. But I think you're right. What I loved about those books is you get to learn so much finance, but it's through stories. And there, you know, there are other fields like this. You know, I think some of the people who are really successful at translating physics or translating philosophy, you know, like Alain de Botton has done for law for philosophy, they tell stories, you know, so it's not like some complicated thing. It's just, it's just storytelling. And, that, and that's, you know, very much what I wanted to do in the book. Hey, before I let you go, I want to get a couple book recommendations, things that you're reading these days that you think the audience might enjoy. But I also want to make a point as I'm holding your book in my hand, I see a lot of books these days. And of course, the number one thing that you think about a book is the content. But it is really nice, though, too, to pick up a book sometimes where somebody has put the time and effort into the physical cover. They've put the time and effort into the pages. So you must have pushed hard with your publisher to get a quality piece of uh, literature that will sit on the shelf because it is a nice looking piece. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that because I, I, one of the things I'm proudest of, and of course my publisher, you know, Rick Wolf at Houghton Mifflin has been fantastic about is every chapter begins with this picture. And the pictures are typically wood prints that are really about what's in the chapter. And I, I was so happy that way that came out because it really meant a lot to me that it was physically beautiful, you know, as well. Because I think books are, you know, books are spectacular and they're physically, you know, they're really important as physical things in addition to their content. 
Okay, before I let you run, what what are you reading? What should the audience be reading that you're reading right now? Wow. So I'll give you two or three things that are just spectacular. So one, if you're looking for fiction, I just finished this book that will take you three hours to read, I promise. It's by an Indian author. It's named. It's called Gachar Gochar. So it's G-H-A-C-H-A-R, Gachar Gochar. It's by Vivek Shanbhag. It's incredible. It's the story of um, an uprising in the middle class in India and what goes wrong and what goes right in that. And it literally, it's like a three-hour book. It's fantastic. So that's one on the fiction side. You know, on the nonfiction side, you know, I'm going to give you a strange one, which is um, I just, you know, recently finished Larissa McFarquhar's Strangers Drowning which is about extreme generosity, you know, which is about people who are extremely generous, you know, like they'll voluntarily give organs away, (laughs) you know, they'll adopt 30 children. And it's the incredible piece of storytelling. And it makes you really rethink a lot of things, you know, in your life. And then for the last one I'll give is maybe something a little more current is, you know, if you're thinking about healthcare and insurance and this debate, then Elizabeth Rosenthal's book, American sickness is fantastic. It's like, you know, what's going on in healthcare, what's going on in insurance. It's a really, it's a really, really nice, really, really nice read. I'm sure I've forgotten a lot of other good things, but that's, uh, those are a couple. Thank you very much for those. As we go out though, I want people to check out the wisdom of finance, discovering humanity in the world of risk and return, risk and return. They're just two fantastic words. I think about them all the time, nonstop. It's life. Hey, where's the best place where we can send people to check you out, find out more information? I got a website, www.meherdesai.org. Um, but also uh, just Google me and you'll find my Harvard page as well. Meher, I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. It's been great fun. Thanks, Michael. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right Trend Following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, Trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.